So this is a scene that is in uh, Willingboro, New Jersey. It's um, Willingboro Lakes. Uh, it's a park nearby, and this is the way it looked before I went on vacation. And of course, the snow melted. So, since the snow melted, uh, when I came back here, I still moved along with the uh, plan that I had uh, from when it was all snow covered. Uh, so the thing that was really inspiring to me uh, about that whole scene was there was that really sinister looking tree. Um, and there's actually some lost footage of me attempting to paint that day. Um, and unfortunately it was just too snowy out. Uh, the, it actually wasn't snowing at that point that I was setting up. And then about 30, 45 minutes into painting, the snow started to come down and really started to get in the way of things. Um, and I was soaking wet when I got back into the house. So um, I figured, all right, I'm just going to go on vacation, come back and work on this here and uh, very drastically different landscape. So, uh, but it doesn't really change the, the plan that I had. So um, again, the, the key word I wanted was uh, sinister um, in thinking of this painting. So I had my uh, sketchbook and uh, you might be able to see it here a little bit um, uh, in some of the shots, but I had wanted to cover the background layer in gouache with a uh, sort of like a mixture of like an orangey and purpley red, um, just to give some slight variation. Uh, and then all the other layers in oil paint were going to allow some of that red to peek through a little bit, uh, especially around the tree itself. Um, so I used a very limited palette, might be hard to see, but I used a uh, purple, uh, yellow ochre, and sap green with uh, white at first. So when you're seeing that grayish uh, background color, the, uh, the sky color, uh, there's a little bit of yellow ochre in that with, uh, with purple, just to sort of neutralize the purple a bit. Uh, and so here I'm just laying in uh, where the trees are going to be at. Uh, when I'd done the sketch for this originally, I had drawn directional lines uh, showing that the tree line was going to be leading to that central tree. Um, but I didn't want it to be that obvious. I wanted to kind of have these implied lines and broken lines that would uh, just lead your eye to that tree. So now just filling in that mid-ground layer and this is it, it sap green is actually a pretty strong color so I had to neutralize that a lot um, so right there what I'm doing is adding a uh, bigger tree in the foreground um, just to give more depth to this picture uh, so sometimes what you can do is uh, add a have have the have almost like a spotlighted effect which is what I was going for here uh, with this painting and so you'll see this in like some of the Dutch landscapes uh, from like the 16th century and what they would do is have a darker uh, foreground element uh, almost like you're in the trees looking at something in the distance that's illuminated uh, a lot of illustrators used to do this too uh, I, they still do today, but Golden Age illustrators like Howard Pyle um, used to do that. Nor, uh, the Wyatts, uh, N.C. Wyatt specifically, would do something like that as well. So, yeah, now that I have the basic compositional elements laid in, now I'm just going to be bouncing around from working on the tree to sort of refining a little bit more of the uh, elements around it like the grass and all that yeah the one thing that I was trying to be careful not to do is to uh, completely cover some of that red though like I wanted the uh, the tree to be dark uh, just to, to have that menacing sort of effect but there was foliage on the tree too so oh and so what I'm doing there is uh, that was just kind of looking at the the textural quality of the the paint and uh, it was just easier also to fill that in, that bottom corner uh, in with the uh, palette knife but just doing it at that angle 
and then uh, so I personally really love palette knives um, I think that it's just a it's a really great tool and you know using a brush for everything or using a palette knife for everything or using you know insert any tool for everything uh, sort of just creates a very monotonous sort of looking uh, picture so I think varying up your tools and also using them for you know maybe things that you wouldn't think you would like using a palette knife to sort of fill in some of the branches versus maybe some of them are brushed in or maybe some of them use a razor um, or a credit card or you know any any or, or just flicking with your brush uh, can just really give a different sort of feel to all of it Uh, so, uh, might be hard to see there. What uh, I used in that case was um, a beard comb. Uh, don't worry, it's not one that I use anymore. Uh, my beard would be pretty interesting if it if I did. Uh, so, uh, I I had realized that there was uh, something when I was working in Photoshop that I thought was really interesting as far as a brush, and uh, it almost looked like a comb, like a hair comb. So I said, why don't I just do that in real life? And, uh, you know, you could take a hair comb and maybe break some of the teeth out if you want to give it a little bit more random uh, effects. Uh, but, yeah, I, I've really enjoyed using it for things like grass or using it for um, t textures that you know are meant to be repetitive. Uh, you could use it for probably like a fence post, something along those lines. Um, th the one thing I would suggest is if you do try to use any tool like that, uh, don't just use it as a as a um, almost like a stamp and just leave it as is. Uh, try to erase some parts out of it, or try to um, use that tool and then maybe do something different, unpredictable with it. Uh, just because again, it just be ends up becoming a handicap uh, and and monotonous a lot of times. There's another trick, sort of, that I do in this one. Um, not sure if it popped up yet, but basically I was trying to fill in some more of the uh, like implied branches that are in the main tree and in some of the side ones. So I took the, um, the brush and sort of uh, splayed it a little bit. Uh, so basically you just take your, your fingers and you just separate the bristles enough to make a random sort of uh, texture, almost like the hair comb too. But it's just another trick. So this is about the end of uh, working on it on the spot. So now I'm going to show you in the studio what I do to finish it off. Okay, so this is going to be slightly different from the other videos uh, just because they've all been done on site. Um, with this one, it's going to be uh, more around if you like one of your paintings that you did, um, how can you kind of give it a, you know, tweak it a little bit in the studio. Um, so in this case, I'm going to show you glazing. Uh, so what is glazing? Glazing is adding a transparent layer to your painting. Um, in order to give, uh, you know, a little bit more depth to your picture. Uh, a lot of times it's uh, a way to add, you know, shadow to a painting. Um, so, in this case here, um, I'm taking Payne's Gray, which was actually the darker color that I had added to my palette towards the end of the painting. Uh, I'm adding that, and since it's a transparent color, I'm going to uh, take a medium... Uh, in this case, it's Galkid. Um, it's actually Alkid. It's just that's what this particular company, uh, Gamblin, calls their version of Galkid. Um, and I'm going to be adding it on almost like watercolor. Um, so the, the idea is that glazing gives almost like a jeweled effect or um, some people compare it to stained glass uh, effect. So there's the surface of your painting. There's the light that's coming through from wherever the light source is. Uh, could be outside, could be indoors. And when the light is coming through, you're, we're just adding this transparent layer of whatever color 
um, to sort of tint the painting a little bit more. So it'll go through there, it'll hit the back of the painting, the light bounces back, and this is the color uh, in combination with the painting surface here that we see. Um, you wouldn't do it with an opaque color, uh, something like a cadmium, um, just because it won't allow that light to bounce through. It'll just stop right here and it won't get to the back of the painting. Um, so, uh, yeah, so in this case, I'm just using Payne's Gray. It was already a color that was on my palette at that point. And I just want to add a little bit more light and shadow um, and a little bit more focus to this tree here. So, yeah, I'm going to keep working on that here. Now you want to use a, sh a soft brush to do this. Uh, the reason being if you use a harder one, um, you might get streaks. And that's also the same reason why you wouldn't uh, typically use a, um, a semi-transparent or a semi-opaque paint either. Um, not just because the light won't go through and do the glazing effect, um, it's also just you'll start to see some uh, streaks because now you're essentially weakening that bond in the uh, paint film. And the great thing is with uh, glazing is that if you uh, tint it just a little bit uh, but you don't like uh, you know how it's not you know maybe you don't think it's dark enough you can always add another layer on top so yeah just using like a, a softer brush here yeah this is actually uh, something that the the old masters did a lot um, was just glazing their surfaces and then that way um, you can create a little bit more depth in the picture there. Yeah. Now the reason the reason I'm doing this is because um, when I was I was looking at it, you know, the, we have this tree that's basically in the center. It's a little bit off, um, but it was just bothering me because I wasn't really looking at it as much as I could be. So. And this is and the other the other uh, thing was I just. I felt like the darks weren't dark enough. And in this particular picture, I, I, I wanted to create a little bit more drama in it. Now, you see there how it almost gives it like a purpley sort of tone to it. Now, the reason it's doing that is because there's red underneath in this surface. So, the light is bouncing through. It's going through this sort of bluish uh, black sort of layer, hitting that uh, red, and then coming back out. And it's creating a little bit more of a purple hue. So, it's, it's really good because it can create subtle color shifts, too. Um, but in this case, I'm not really too 
happy with the way that that looks so I'm just gonna it's a little bit too strong for what I'm trying to do uh, so you can wipe it out I mean if you wanted to take paint thinner um, you could take that out and you know but I, I rather do it with just a rag uh, especially if you're someone that is um, worried about the the health effects of paint thinners so same thing here just adding this a little bit there with the intention that I'm gonna erase it out and what's really neat is um, if you do this over a textured surface um, it it really sort of brings that that texture forward a little bit so in a way that if it uh, was on just a very if you're a painter that's using very uh, smooth techniques that wouldn't really happen so that that could be another reason why you might want to do this so anyway yeah so I feel like this has created more of a sense of drama uh, in the painting that just wasn't really there um, it almost had it has more of a spotlight effect which is kind of what I was going for when I uh, started to paint it um, and you know on on site it's nice to have those sort of goals but sometimes the paint just doesn't work with you so this is just another way to tweak it a little bit so anyway hope you enjoy